to the Italian Football Podcast. Let's move on to uh, to Inter, the takeover situation, because last week especially, we started to see a lot more reports uh, intensifying about Thomas Ziliakus being the new owner of, of Inter. Um, so can, first of all, can you just give us uh, a little update on where you see the, the takeover? And then secondly, can you just give us like a little profile of, of Ziliakus? Uh, who is he? How rich is he? What we can expect if he takes over at Inter? You know, all that kind of stuff. Because you have uh, interviewed him for Semper yes. Inter recently. So you know, you know him better than most. No, I, I, I sat down with him for 45 minutes in the summer and we've been in contact since. Uh, we, he's Finnish Swede, uh, or he, he speaks Swedish fluently, like that's his mother tongue, just like Finnish is. Uh, he speaks Italian fluently and English fluently, but obviously when you can speak in your mother tongue, you're, you know, I, it was a much more relaxing and he could express himself more clearly and that's why I wanted to do the interview in Swedish. And, and we sat down for 45 minutes uh, to talk about that and and who he was and how he was and he he um you know he comes from you know he is a a you could almost say Finnish uh, aristocracy in the sense that he comes from a big family that is very well known in in uh, in in Finland in business I mean he was the former CEO of Nokia Southeast Asia um, and you know he he um, he he lived there in 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 Singapore uh, for very many years, um, and he he was he was the CEO there, of course, of Nokia and Nokia Southeast Asia, and, and there and then he um, he was asked to to become um, the, the the Singapore FA asked him to become involved in local football. Uh, a semi-professional league had been set up and he became the manager of a team called Geylang International FC. And he was there five years and they won the league every year, five years in a row. Um, and, and of course, you know, he, you know, that, that, that's, that's his director's experience in football, but he's also, you know, like I said, he's a, he's a big director uh, in, in business and fine uh, in, in business. And, you know his 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 experience with football is is quite interesting. He he told me when I interviewed him that when he was a kid he got a book, uh, or he 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 got um, a, a magazine with an interview with Pele, where he where Pele said that he you know he didn't you if you want to be a footballer you should never drink or smoke and he 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 didn't until he was twenty one years old. Um, and, and was just, you know, training really hard to become uh, a footballer, which he did in, in Finland. Um, and, and he played for IFK Helsingfors, uh, which is like one of the biggest uh, clubs there. Uh, and, and then he went to Hojiko, which is the most big, the biggest club there. And then one year he decided he wanted to, uh, he, as a youth player, he was 21 years old, um, he did. He, that was incidentally when when he had his first drink <laughs> as well, as he, he told me, because because of the Pele thing uh, for seven years. So so what happened was he went to uh, his friends were his parents were friends with the president of the Finnish FA, um, and he told him in passing that you know he dreamt of traveling to South America and Brazil. And so what happened was that he was able to play with Fluminense's youth academy for one year. Um, he spent a season there and, and of course, a calendar year there, um, you know, and they were, he, he always says that, uh, you know, he got to play in front of the Maracanã with 160,000 people um, uh, with the youth team. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it was, it was crazy. And, and he, you know, Rivellino was there. Um, and so he, as he told me, he says that, you know, when he got the chance to take the pitch after having played in front of 160,000 people in a, in a, for a, in a youth team game for Fluminense, he, uh, he realized that he'd reached the peak of his career, um, because he, he was never going to play in front of those crack crowds ever again. Um, and how he got into, you know, Inter, or wanting to buy Inter, I mean, his his he fell in love with Italy. He told me that you know he spent summers in Capri, um, and he thinks he might have played football with Sandro Mazzola because he was 15 years old and he was there to learn Italian, and they used to play football on a pitch in in uh, nearby the school, um, and there was an Inter star who was on holiday there, 
um, and he can't remember who exactly who he was, but he has a memory of it being Sandro Mazzola, uh, who he played football with. Um, and he fell in love with Italy. Um, and the whole thing with, 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 with wanting to invest in Italian football was after the Manchester United thing. Um, he, his wife had lunch in New York with, was visiting one of his daughters who lived there. And his wife had had, had, had lunch in New York with Dan Swift's wife. <laughs> and Dan Swift is, of course, a partner in Redbird. And his, and his wife had told, uh, Dan Swift's wife had told Thomas's wife that, they, they had bought AC Milan. And so he contacted him and said, look, um, I want to get in. And he said, well, unfortunately, you know, there's not, there's no possibility to get in here. We've already closed the deal. And he, and then, so what he did was basically decided to put together a, a group of investors and he released a press statement saying that they've raised a billion, over a billion dollars in, in US dollars from investors to invest in football, uh, fashion, sport, uh, and sports, and, 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 and business generally. Um, so, you know, he's, he's, been very <clears throat> he's been very open about how, whether he wants to take over or whether he wants to be involved in some capacity, and he's very, you know, he's been very, you know, he's, he speaks very highly of Suning and the, the Zhang family and say they've been very kind to him and invited him. And he's just basically doesn't want to go into too much detail, but he doesn't feel that maybe the Zhang family are prepared to sell Inter and he doesn't want to come across as pushy. But he's been very clear in saying that he wants to be involved in some way. And, and he is a traditional, typical Scandinavian entrepreneur in the sense that he thinks very much outside the box. I spoke to him about what he would like to do differently. And he's got this idea. He's, he's basically, his, his idea is this. Inter have 500 million fans globally. Now, an overwhelming majority of them will never be able to see Inter live at the San Siro or whatever stadium, no matter how big that stadium is, right? So he wants to start doing things like using technology to sell experiences to fans, um, you know, uh, to, to sell experiences, like a virtual stadium experiences, meaning that if you, a fan can sit in Stockholm, Lagos, Shanghai, and visit the stadium, right? And, and, and he's, he's, he's looking at monetizing in modern new, out, new, new ways that is quite new to football, um, which in other businesses is not that, you know, innovative at all. It's it's just how businesses work, right? Um, so he he's a very typical Scandinavian entrepreneur in that aspect, um, and he's an interesting character. Um, and we'll see what happens. I, I I still think that he doesn't. That this is just my personal opinion. It's not something he said. My personal opinion is that he would love to invest in Inter and, and become a stakeholder if he's given guarantees that he can run marketing and 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 you know incre- you know create new revenue streams for inter um but i don't think that he, that that's something that the zhang family would want to do given that it kind of encroaches a lot in what they do um but we'll have to wait and see <laughs>